I've been having Bible studies a great deal over at Tucson, and I think perhaps you may have heard some of them here. Uh, when I have just taken books in the New Testament and gone through chapter by chapter, verse by verse. I used to preach that way many years ago, and I found that was a, one of the better ways of preaching, as a matter of fact. Now, you can't read the Bible straight through from beginning to end. There is a story flow in the Bible, in a way. It begins with the creation of man, and it does show how man was offered life and did not choose it, rather choose to have his own way, because we can only have life God's way, in a way that will liberate us from troubles, that will free us from pains and sorrows and sufferings and unhappiness of every kind. It's the way of his law, and it is a law of liberty, and we're going to see a lot about that tonight. So Adam did shut not only himself but his whole family, the human family, off from life. He rejected that tree of life and took the tree or took to himself the knowledge of good and evil to decide for himself what he thought was right and wrong. Perhaps he didn't realize that Satan was on the throne of the earth, still is there, no longer the wonderful archangel Lucifer, who was perfect in all of his ways from the day he was created, till iniquity was found in him. But there he was, and Adam was influenced to go his way. When Adam chose to take to himself the knowledge of what is right and what is wrong, he was influenced by Satan. And he did choose Satan's way of self-centeredness of getting instead of giving, of materialism, and he only had a chemical existence. He did not have life, because in Christ is life. So we read in the New Testament, in the beginning was the Word. Now, the Word was a being, a personage, who was the spokesman of the Godhead, and the Word was with God, and God then was another personage, so we had the two together, and the Word was also God, and all things were made by Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made, but in Him was life. He was the light of men. But the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Now the Bible starts in Genesis with the creation of man without life. Man merely in a, a, a physical human being made from the dust of the ground. And even our life comes from the energy that comes out of the ground. Now we've been in an energy crisis in the last year or more here in the United States. In fact, the whole world really is except over in Saudi Arabia and one or two places like that. Energy does come out of the ground. And we have a kind of energy that we derive from eating of food and drinking of water, from the breathing of air, and from the circulation of blood. That is our existence, and it is not life. In Ephesians 2 and verse 1, Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus that you were, while you were Gentile born, you were dead in trespasses and sins. They didn't have life. But we find in 1 John that he that has the Son of God has life. And he that has not the Son of God has not life. Now in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. All things were made by him. And in him was life. Christ came to bring life. The first Adam came to bring a human, mechanical, temporary existence, which means you are in the process of dying every breath you take, every day you live. 
And every one of you is one breath away from dying, from dead, from being dead. That's all. If you don't take the next breath, you won't live. We do not have life. Christ came to bring us life. But God does not want us to have life in unhappiness. And so God put a law in his government, and you can't have a government without a basic law or a constitution of some sort. The angels rejected that. The archangel Lucifer rejected it. That is a way of life. It is a way that will free you from unhappiness and sorrows and suffering and troubles and unhappiness. It is the only way that will bring you any real happiness and peace and joy. It is the way of a filled, fulfilled life, a life that is filled full, a life that is interesting, a life that is well, it doesn't need to be absolutely exciting all of the time, but absolutely invigoratingly interesting. That's the kind of life God intended for us to have. But the world doesn't have that kind of life and never did have. Now, the world was cut off from life. God made one exception of the prophets of the Old Testament. But the chemical existence came with Adam, but life came with Jesus Christ. Now, in these annual holy days, we are being reminded every year of God's plan, his master plan, of bringing us from a chemical existence into life. Life in peace and life in happiness and life freed from all the burdens of unhappiness, of sorrows, of suffering, of antagonisms, of hatreds, of everything that is unpleasant, unenjoyable, and that we really don't want. It is a law of liberty that is the way of God. And so the first of these festivals celebrates the Passover, which we did on last Friday night, the week tomorrow night. The crucifixion of Christ to take on himself the penalty we've all incurred by breaking that law and bringing unhappiness on ourselves and on others. Because when you sin, you bring unhappiness on others as well as yourself. And then we began the seven days of unleavened bread, showing that we must put sin out of our lives. And sin is the transgression of that law. Sin is going the way that is going to harm you and hurt you, that hurts other people, that brings unhappiness and wretchedness. into the way that frees us from all of those things we don't want. So I thought we'd read a little more about that tonight in one of these days of unleavened bread from the book of James. Now, James, I think most authorities agree that the James who wrote this is the James who was a brother of Christ. He was also a son of Mary, the mother of Jesus and of Joseph, her husband. Anyway, a brother of Jesus. And he was the pastor of the headquarters church at Jerusalem also, and the one who acted as chairman at the meeting that they had there, to read up in the 15th chapter of the book of Acts, where a decision had to be made. Actually, it was Peter who made that decision. James, as the, what you might call, what we would call today, chairman of the, of, of the meeting, at which there had been much disputing until Peter rose up and settled everything, James merely approved and made official by his official position as the pastor of the headquarters church the decision. So James was one of the apostles, and... James was one of those who was inspired to write part of the Bible. 
And this book that he wrote is a very important book. Now, I don't know whether I'll get past the first chapter tonight. I hope we can go to two chapters at least. I doubt if we'll have time for the whole book, but I'm going to start at the beginning and just go through, as I've been doing, that you've heard some of them, I believe, that have been on tape, that I've done over, uh, really, in the office that I've built on my home over in Tucson. But beginning in the book of James, chapter 1, beginning with verse 1, James, a servant of God. He doesn't say, I'm the big I am, I'm a big boss, and I've got to be a big high position now. He's just a servant, and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into different temptations. Now, other translations translate that trials, troubles, or tests that have come. Sometimes they come from other people. But I think the uh, Greek word here and the James intended means includes temptations as well as troubles and trials that come from other people. Often they really come from Satan, even though other people are used to bring them. So count it all joy. We don't. We, do, we don't count it joy. How do you count it when troubles come, when everything is going wrong, when there's real trouble? How did you count it about two and a third years ago now when the trouble hit the church? Or was that as bad as when some trouble hits you personally, maybe a real serious financial trouble, something terrible? Do you count it joy or are you really troubled and think, oh boy, that's tough, that's terrible? But he says to count it joy. Because we're on the way in a transient, chemical, temporary existence into life. And there aren't going to be any more troubles when we get there. And enduring these troubles, in enduring them, and in coming through them through faith in Christ, we become stronger ourselves. And we're stronger characters and we are going to have that much more that will give us joy and enjoyment in the kingdom of God and in all eternity. How long is this life? I've lived the age of practically every one of you here because I'm, I may be the oldest person here tonight. I don't know. But I know that when I was younger, it just seemed like we'd go on living forever. Well, I've heard so many people talking about my age that I don't, I don't know. I've looked at the calendar and I begin to realize that maybe I'm a little older than I thought I was. And I know that uh, I'm not going to live another hundred years in this life or another 88 and a half years for that matter. And I realize that we're just here for a certain amount of time. And in the church, judgment is on us. Now, God did not put judgment on the world. The world was cut off from life when he closed the Garden of Eden from anybody ever entering there. He didn't necessarily cut people off from God. A few could seek him. Abel was called righteous Abel by Jesus. Enoch walked with God. Noah was found righteous. I think when it says he was perfect in his generations, it was speaking of his family perfection by heredity rather than uh, speaking of uh, his character perfection. But he did find grace in God's sight. And he was walking with God, and two can't walk together except they be agreed. And so God chose him and his family, his wife, their sons, and their sons' wives, a total of eight people, to keep the human chemical existence alive and going. 
We don't know much about what happened before the flood. Very little is given us in the Bible. So God shut off judgment until Christ came. Judgment could not be on Israel. It wasn't. Israel was never offered the Holy Spirit. When, you are, when judgment is on you, you're being tried and tested to see whether you can gain eternal life or whether you're going to reject it. You have to make a choice. You have to decide you really want to live the way that will make you happy and make those around you happy. If you want to live the way it's going to make everybody else unhappy and cause sorrow and suffering to all kinds of people as well as yourself, God isn't going to let you have eternal life. And judgment is then as much an opportunity for salvation. In fact, it's a lot more. It isn't a condemnation at all. It's a trying and testing. And we're in a time of trying and testing in the church. And that's why James says here, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall in the different trials or temptations. We're being tested. We're being judged every day that we live. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience. Now, in other words, you get in trouble. There's only one way out, and that's through faith in Christ. You're depending on yourself to get out. You probably won't get out of it. But we who are in the church are expected to rely on Christ to pull us out. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. So says your Bible. It is through much tribulation we must enter into the kingdom of God. So, naturally, what is the way we get out of our trials, our troubles, persecutions, whatever? our temptations. It's living faith. And it's not your faith. It's not a faith you work up. It's not a faith you create and stimulate. It's the faith of Christ that God will put in you through the Holy Spirit. God gives you that faith. You don't have it. It's the faith of Christ, not your faith in Christ. It's his faith placed in you by a gift from God. Let's get that straight. Now, knowing this is a trying of your faith. And it's expected that a Christian is going to use faith when the trials and temptations come. will work patience or endurance. And he that endureth unto the end, the same shall be saved. And we have to overcome these things if we're going to reign with Christ, putting other scriptures together with it. But let patience have her perfect work that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, that is, he doesn't scold or condemn you or anything or upbraid you, and it shall be given. Well, there are conditions, as we'll read on in the next verse. But you know, one of the first things I learned when I was first converted back in the spring of 1927, and many of you have been born since that, one of the first things I learned is that I did not have wisdom. I just lacked wisdom. Now, I always craved understanding, and I craved uh, knowledge up to a certain extent. I've known others that I think have craved knowledge more than I have. But I wanted understanding. But I found I didn't have wisdom. That's a little different. Wisdom is the ability to make wise decisions and use that knowledge and that understanding. They sort of go together, but there is a difference and a distinction. So I did ask God. Now, I haven't always exercised wisdom, but I have on and off, and I have a good deal of the time. And that wisdom, any that I have ever used, has always come from God. I didn't have it naturally at all. It has all come from God. But now notice what he, he, he gives here a condition on that. But let him ask in faith nothing 
wavering or doubting, not, not doubting at all, for he that wavereth or doubts is like a wave of the sea, which is uh, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think he shall receive anything from the Lord. You have to believe God. You know, that makes me think of a woman I was called on one time. It was up in uh, oh, a town south of Eugene in Oregon before I ever came down to Pasadena. And uh, she'd asked me to come and uh, pray for her and anoint her for healing. Well, I said, uh, if I do pray for you and ask God to heal you and I anoint you, do you think you will be healed? Well, so I, I don't know if it's God's will, I know he will. Oh, I said, if. So you have a doubt. You're not quite sure then whether it's God's will. Well, he says, we, we, we can't know his will, can we? Well, uh, I said, do you, uh, do you believe that it is his will to forgive you your sins? Oh, yes, yes, I know that's his will. Oh, you do? Well, I turn back here in the Bible to Psalms uh, 3. See if I can't turn to it right quickly here. Well, anyway, it's about 103, I think, or 104. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities? I said, you believe that? Because it says so right here. Oh, yes, I believe that. I said, read the other half of the same sentence. She read it, and I says, who, for, who healeth all thy diseases? Well, I said, you believe one half of the sentence, but you don't believe God when he says the other part. Well, I don't remember whether she really believed that or not. I think maybe she did and was healed, because a good many people were healed in those days and since. Anyway, when God says he will do something, he really means it. And not very many people believe God. We're expected to believe him. So when he says he will give you wisdom, believe it. Believe it. But if you're going to doubt and waver, don't think you'll expect anything from God at all because you won't. Don't think God is so good he just gives anybody any and everything they want regardless. God is that, uh, sometimes we want to be better than God, you know. God doesn't do that. Now he says, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted. Now I believe the meaning of that, and the Moffat translation does make it more plain, that the one who is poor and in society rated of low degree He's not a multimillionaire. He's not a man of real great importance or something like that. He's humble, but uh, he believes in God. And uh, does the brother, it just says a brother, which I'm a member in the church, so he must believe in God, rejoice in that he is exalted. He is exalted by being a son of God. He is a begotten son of God. And that is something to exalt him. But the rich, in that he is made low, because as the flower of the grass, he shall pass away. Well, he can rejoice when he's made low in the Lord. But if he doesn't, and he still thinks that uh, he's better than anybody else, he's just like a flower. When the well, the next verse explains it, how the wind comes and what it does. For the sun is no sooner risen with the burning heat, especially in the summertime, but it withereth the grass, and uh, the flower thereof falleth, and the grace of the fashion of it perisheth. In other words, the beauty and the glory of a, a flower, and uh, I, I think the Revised Standard, or the Moffat, is a little more plain there, and, and brings it out with the, the real glory and the beauty of a rose or many flowers. How beautiful they are. 
How could a man think up something like that and de design it? And yet it grows right out of the ground. God has designed it. We have to have a great designer as well as a creator. And the grace of the fashion of it perisheth, so shall the rich man fade away in his ways. Yes, he does. And he's soon gone, and he doesn't take his wealth with him, does he, when he dies? If he relies on that and physical, material goods, he hasn't got very much to rely on. And he's only dying every day he lives. He hasn't found life yet at all. Remember, it's more important that we find life. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation or trials, whichever, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life. See, we don't have life, but he'll receive the crown of life, which we don't have. We weren't born with it. And shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted that I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. Now, God cannot be tempted. What are you going to do with the fact that Jesus was here in the human flesh and was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin? Well, the answer to that is that Jesus was man as well as God. Now, Jesus is now God and so are they God again, and he couldn't be tempted today, and neither has the Father ever been tempted. But Jesus took on the temporary chemical existence of a human life, but there was the spirit of eternal life within him. And he did not sin, but he was tempted. But he did die, and he was made mortal So, for the very purpose of death, as you read in Hebrews. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away by his own lust and enticed. In other words, by your own desires. I think... No, I, I don't have another translation here. I'm not, I haven't checked that. I'm not sure the other translation used the word lust. We think usually of lust as in a sex point of view, whereas we usually think, I think of uh, oh, the last of the Ten Commandments, coveting as coveting just material goods or money. But this can be pleasure. Your lust there that will entice you can be pleasure, it can be going along with other people, it can be anything that other people are doing. Now that is the world we live in, and I, that's where I want to stop and say a few things right there. We're living in a world that is not living by the law of God. We're living in a world that is seeking its own pleasures. It's seeking what it can get in material goods. It wants to get and not to give. And it wants to enjoy life, but it wants to enjoy it physically, materially. And we have it all around us, everywhere, all around us. Now, some people wondered why I brought what looks like about uh, 15 or 20 or 30 newspapers here tonight. Actually, this is just last Sunday's Los Angeles Times. It's only one day's newspaper, and there were about a million two hundred thousand of them printed. If you'd stack one on top of the other, I, I, I think they'd reach up to higher than the Empire State Building in New York. And there are a couple of buildings higher than that in New York now. But I thought I'd like to just show you a little of this. Now here's the first page, and here's, here's the, the main news, and there's quite a section here, a great many pages. Let's see if I can see. 36 pages, and that's only the first section. And there's just all kinds of news about what's going on in the world. Always they will have sort of like a magazine article over on the left-hand column, and they had one here about uh, come down shock, out of a job, transitions, bitter pill. Some people losing jobs, and what a bitter pill it is. 
That'll be man's philosophizing about man's troubles. But here's a picture of President Reagan and his wife and him raising up a hand and all that sort of thing and what's going on in the world. But I just want to show you. The newspaper has to give the people what they want. We used to have a saying that we used in business years ago. We said, Jones pays the freight, give Jones what he wants. And that's, that's business, you see. Whatever the people want, give it to them. Because that's the way to get their money. And business is the case of trying to get money. Now we come to another section here, and it's calendar. And that gives you all of the entertainment, the shows, and everything like that. You'll even find perhaps one of our own ads in there of uh, uh, some of the fine arts performances that will be on in this auditorium. Now let me see how many pages there are in this. This is about as thick as that first section. The pages must be numbered here someplace. Oh, I think this is 30-some pages. I can't find it. But it's very, very thick. And that's just filled with movies, entertainments, this and that and the other thing, people seeking entertainment. Who are the celebrities in the world? Well, they're over in Hollywood. Well, what are they? They're entertainers. They're entertainers. That's what they are. Now, if they live in great mansions, if they have millions of dollars, that's wonderful. Everyone wants them to have that. But they wouldn't want a servant of God to have anything like that. Now, here comes another whole section. This is a pretty good-sized section, too. I don't know whether... Now, this has 30 pages. Well, I know that one had more of them. This is travel. Now, that's another thing that people like is to travel. Boy, do they love that. That's pleasure. Well, let me tell you, I've done more traveling than any of you here, I think. And traveling, if you keep it up, is certainly not pleasure. It's one of the most fatiguing, tiresome things there is. <laughs> now, here's an eight-page section. Metro, of just local news, things of that kind. There's something about Mayor Bradley. Says he's ahead and looks, uh, looks to the governor race. Well, uh, you know, that reminds me. I had the strong man of Europe, Franz Joseph Strauss, in my home about 10 years ago now for a dinner. He'd been on the campus here at Ambassador College, and he said that evening was the happiest day he'd ever spent in his life. He just loved everything he saw here. Someone asked him that night, he said, look, you're a politician. And uh, at that time, I think President Nixon had just been elected. I believe it was Nixon's election. Someone said, uh, what, uh, I mean, he had just taken the oath of office, just the inauguration. Someone said, uh, while he was holding up his hand and swearing with one hand on the Bible to defend the Constitution, what do you think was going on in his mind? He says, why? How to be reelected next time, of course. A politician is always thinking how to be reelected or how to step up to another higher political office. You know, we've had politicians in the church. They wanted a higher office all the time. Moses had some politicians with him. One of them was named Korah. Did you ever hear of him? He had a pretty good position, but he wasn't satisfied. He wanted a higher one. Moses said, you weren't satisfied with what God gave you. You wanted a lot more. So Moses didn't punish him. Moses didn't have to. God took care of that. He just let the earth open up and swallow up Korah and all of his group and cover them up and cover them with dust. They were well buried. <laughs> well, now we come to another. Here's what people get. The newspaper gives people what they want. What are they interested in? This is what the world is interested in. Well, here's the San Gabriel Valley section. Now, if you lived in another area around here, you'd get a different section. I see there's a second section on that, which is the classified just for the San Gabriel Valley. Now, next we come to a real estate section. Well, people are interested in homes and things like that. Of course, now, that might be perfectly all right. It might not be any 
worldliness or anything wrong. And even we can be interested in that. But there's quite a, quite a real estate section here. There are two sections, really. Now, the first one is uh, uh, 28 pages. Well, I guess it's uh, 54 pages altogether in that section about real estate. Then we come to uh, a section here that is uh, news features. Legal services agency battles something Reagan attempt to cut something off. Gets into politics and some more of the world's interests, but certainly there's nothing about God in it, so I can promise you that. Here's a section I don't find any heading to, but there's another section here of... Uh, Well, I don't know whether this all together is 44 pages, whatever it is, maybe it's part of that other section. Anyway, it's a 44-page section. Now, this, I think, is just a lot of ads and a, a color kind of a brochure. A lot of people stick a lot of flyer ads in there. And here's some more of that. And, of course, we've got to have the funnies or it wouldn't be a newspaper. Yeah, the kids like that. I used to like them. And some of the funny thing is, some of the funnies that were in the paper when I was a little boy are still running. I don't think the same men are still drawing them because they've grown old and died before now, but someone else is doing it. Oh, I see Andy Cap here. Now, I, is that a takeoff on Al Cap? I, don't, I haven't read a funny paper in years. So I don't know what they are doing, but that's got to be in every Sunday newspaper. Now we come to one that's called View. Now, oh, here's quite a section, and I think it gives people's point of view. Everybody has his view. Well, I tell you, now, my view on that is thus and so. <laughs> Another guy said, well, uh, my view is a little different, and they're never going to agree. Well, in the church, Paul tells us that we must all be of one mind, and uh, we must all speak the same thing. And if we get God's truth, we will. But in the world, they've got all the views in the world. So here's the view section, and they waste 28 pages on that. <laughs> now we come to opinion. Besides views, they've got opinion. Well, now what's your opinion? John or Dick or Fred or whoever you are, what's your opinion? Here's my opinion. And I think this and I think so-and-so. And Well, I, t I tell you, what I think is so-and-so. Everybody has what he thinks. He has his opinion, he has his view. And they don't agree because they just don't know the truth. So this is quite a section, too. Poland steps back from the brink, barely, just barely. That's not so thick as some of them, but they, at least they got opinions in it. The six pages, that's another section. Now, that's just one day's newspaper. Now we come going on business. You've got to have a lot of business because people have got to make money off of you. And so people are interested somewhat, or at least some people are interested in some kinds of business, and they have 26 pages they wasted on that here. And now we come to sports. Boy, well, all the men want sports. I notice at home they'll take the sports section out every morning, put it over on the breakfast table for me. And I don't find much I'm interested in sports in any longer. But I did used to be. But as I get older, I, I think less about it. Of course, that's mostly for men, but women are getting an interest in sports now. That's more entertainment. That's all entertainment. Then we come to a magazine here. Of course, they got to slip a magazine into a weekly newspaper. This is a whole magazine, a lot of nice color printing in it. Let's see if I can tell how many pages. I think there are more pages in it than there are in the plain truth. No, I can't find a number. All the industry people in the things of this world, things that are material and physical and just pleasures and sports, 
and all of those things. Now we come to classified ads. Of course, you've got to have a lot of those. Now here, here's one section of uh, 22 pages. I started in the advertising business selling classified ads when I was 18 years old. You didn't know classified ads are sold. Well, they are. I didn't know it until then either. Now here it looks like the two or three more sections of classified ads. That's bigger than most newspapers ought to be. I get most of the news in the first 10 or 15 minutes of either CBS or NBC or ABC's World News Tonight or whatever they call it. And I get it condensed and I have to use a magnifying glass when I read and so I don't read so much. Well, with three sections of one ad, that's, that's really, that's thicker than most newspapers. Now that's one day's newspaper. That's what people are interested in. Now they're interested in shows, they're interested in television. And on television you see sex, 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 sex. You will see through the day the women like to watch soap operas. Every soap opera has got a, a real villain woman, did you know that? I didn't know that till I saw something, I don't know, in a magazine or something I read not too long ago. I, uh, I had not watched soap operas, so I didn't know that before. But every soap opera has got its, its villain woman. She is really a, a dirty kind of a woman. She's mean. She just is deliberately mean. She tries to deceive the others. She pretends she's a, a rotten, dirty hypocrite. So they have someone that can act that part. Now, I don't think it's very hard to find one that can do that. <laughs> or men either, for that matter. I'm not just saying that against women. I think that's true of all humanity, but uh, they have that. Then, of course, you've got to have a lot of a lot of violence. It seems like people just love to watch violence. People love to watch a prize fight. Why? Why do they want to watch someone try to pummel another guy's brains out? I tell you, in the world tomorrow, we're not going to watch any prize fights at all. You're going to miss it? You want to say, I don't want to be in the world tomorrow? There won't be any prize fights. We're going to try to protect the other person's brains and his head. Of course, I hope that we will be composed of spirit and not of mortal flesh then, and we'll be helping those people that do have mortal flesh. But you find everything on television. Women have got to look sexy. I don't know whether men do or not. I, uh, I don't know what would be a sexy looking man. I, I just don't know. But I, I guess women find some men are sexy looking. Anyway, they appeal to sex and they appeal to violence. Or they have the, the soap operas, I think, deal primarily with problems that you have in the home, and in this world, it's the kind of problems the world has. It's always trouble, trouble, trouble. Well, God deliver us from those things, and he will in due time. He will. Now, those things attract us all. Those newspapers attract us. Those are things that tempt us. They are things that draw us that way. Things on television draw us that way. They draw our children that way, and they're things we should not be wasting our time on. Now let's get back and see what James says about it. Every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. You see, at first you just look at it a little bit. Then you get a little more interested. If you put it out of your mind right away, then you're rid of it. But as long as you let it just kind of hang on a little bit, it begins to get you. Now James explains that here. It's one of the best explanations of how you get into sin that you can find anywhere. Then they'd be ashamed to say that. They like to brag about how, how naughty and how wicked they are. 
That's what they like to do. So finally, if you look at it, and if you let your mind dwell on it a little bit, it conceives. And then comes the action that is sin. Now, it's not sin till you finally give in. But how many times have you done it? Every one of you. Think about your own life and think back. How many times have you done it? When lust is conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. Now, we have a temporary mechanical existence in this life. It's only going to last so long. It'll bring that death, and your death is going to be eternal. If, if judgment is on you now, you're having your chance right now. You're being tried and tested for the final result right now. Every one of us, if we're in God's church. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, not from below. You don't find it in the things in that newspaper. You don't find it in the things on television. You don't find it in the things of this world around you. And we're living in this world. And they throw sex at you. And they throw these entertainments at you. And they throw interests at you everywhere in the world. Now, in the world tomorrow, they aren't going to have that. There isn't going to be any Satan around. You see, judgment hasn't come on the world yet, but it has come on us, and we have a little harder job than the people that are not converted. I heard of some people saying that we're employed right here on this campus. Well, I'm not converted. I can do things against you, and I can lie and do whatever I want to do. I can cheat, I can lie, I can steal, I can do anything. But you're a Christian. You can't do it. I'm going to get you. Yes, that's happened here. That's come to me. Isn't that wonderful? I can do all of the things that are going to make me suffer and make others suffer. You can't do that thing. You're a converted Christian. Well, some people are absolutely foolish. Simpletons. They lack sense in their upper story. They just do. Because it doesn't make sense. But every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no uh, variableness, neither shadow of turning. God is just steady, going right down the one line all the time, the right line, the line that leads to peace, the line that leads to real happiness and joy, and a filled, full life. They'll be filled with a lot more real peace and happiness and joy than you get on the kind of things you find tempting people in that newspaper or that you find on television, or that you find in the world. The people want all the things they can get in this world. Some will say, well, I better get all I can get now, or I can get it, because pretty soon I won't get it. Maybe I'll have to go into that kingdom of God. Or do you feel that way? Well, I hope you don't. Of his own will begat he, that is God, begat he us with the word of truth. That is, we're begotten. We, we're not born yet as God beings, but we are begotten to become God beings. We will become God personages. I wonder if we really realize that, do we? Do we really realize that? Has that ever really gotten through to us? And it comes through the word of truth right here. These words are never going to mislead you. They are the right way. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth that we uh, should be of kind of first fruits of his creatures. 
You see, judgment is first on the church. Judgment never came to ancient Israel. Judgment never came to people until the church, until Christ. You see, it's a chemical existence that came with Adam, but life comes with Christ. And the only ones were the prophets of the Old Testament that were sort of uh, begotten of God a little before the time for the writing of the Old Testament. They were. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow in wrath. Are we like that? How do we do? This is telling us what some of the leaven is that we need to get out of our hearts and out of our lives. Most of us like to talk. And sometimes I think women like to talk better than men do. I don't know why. I know quite often I get letters, and it'll be from a husband and wife, but the woman will write it. That's not always true. When I get letters from one of our ministers, it's usually the minister who writes it. But uh, just members or other people, I find often it's the wife who does it. And women certainly can gab and talk when they get together. Well, maybe that's all harmless. Maybe it's just fine. You better be sure it is. But here he says, let every, it's not just man, it says man here, but let every person be swift to hear slow to speak and slow to wrath. Be slow to get emotions aroused and start answering back real heatedly. Now a lot of us can go to work on that point. That's another bit of leaven a lot of us can get out of our lives. A lot of them are mentioned right here in James. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God, Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and all of this careless kidding and speaking that people get into. You know, I, I can't imagine Jesus doing that and telling a lot of dirty jokes and things like that. I can't imagine that. He never did it. How many of you ever heard me tell a dirty joke? Raise your hands. I don't see any hands going up. Because you would not be telling the truth if you raised your hands, because none of you has ever heard me tell a dirty joke. I just don't tell them. And I don't keep them in my mind. The wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Wherefore... Lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and uh, receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. Now, what, are, what is the soul? The soul is the physical human body breathing air. God made formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life or existence, chemical existence, and man, made of the dust of the ground, became a living soul. So a soul came from the dust of the ground. Now, you notice here that the Word of God is able to save our souls, our breathing selves. And we won't be souls made out of the dust of the ground any longer. We're not immortal souls, but we can become immortal spirit beings and God beings. But be ye doers of the word. Now, just reading it is not enough. We have to be a doer of it. It's as many as are led by the Spirit of God that are the sons of God, not those that read about it. It takes a lot of doing. It's the way you live. It's what you do and how you do it.
Be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he just heard about it, but he doesn't do it, he is like a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, he goeth his way, and straightway he forgetteth what manner of a man he was. He doesn't do anything about it. Now, I have always likened that. Uh, I, I've, I've used that when people used to bring up to me years ago. They used to bring up a passage of Scripture back here in Romans, the third chapter and verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. By the deeds of the law, no flesh shall be justified. Now, people that believe in Sunday instead of Saturday, they certainly will shout that at you. And I used to have that so much more in the early days up in Eugene, Oregon, before we even started the college down here in 1947. Uh, there was a lot of controversy about the Sabbath, much more than we hear today. And they would use scriptures like this. No flesh can be justified by the works of the law. Or the deeds is not speaking of the works of the law here, the ergon, but doing the way is speaking of here of God's spiritual law. Some places, especially in Galatians, it's speaking of the physical law of rituals and not the spiritual law of the Ten Commandments. But here it's undoubtedly speaking of the Ten Commandments. But therefore, by the deeds of the law, the Ten Commandments, by doing it, you shall not be justified, not in God's sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Now, I've used this very thing that James says many a time, and people could understand it. I said, in almost any woman's purse, you will find a little mirror. And she takes out the mirror to look at her face, and then maybe she takes out a powder puff, or maybe she takes out some other of her makeup stuff, and uses it, but she looks at her face. Now, by the use of a mirror looking, no faces will be washed clean, or no faces will get painted and made up either by the use of the mirror. It only shows you what is there and what, what is needed, that's all. That's what the law does. You see, James explains it here. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like some man that beholds his face in a mirror. He sees what's wrong, but he doesn't do anything about it. The law tells us when we're sinning. It tells us what sin is. Now, you can only be justified through the blood of Christ. But, Justification comes as a result of repentance and beginning to be a doer from that time on. Don't sin anymore. Come out of sin. That's why we're having the seven days of unleavened bread, to show us we are not to continue in sin. Every one of you people there, all of you, you're sinners, every one of you. So am I. Makes me think of the drunk who was walking on the side of the street, and someone came up and said, You're drunk. He said, He's so... I know it, so am I. <laughs> well, we're all sinners, but we don't need to go on in sin. And we, we, uh, that's what we're having to learn this week, is that we put sin out of our lives. We look into God's perfect law, and it says law of liberty. Now, I've been saying a lot about that tonight since I came up here. It's a law of liberty. It will liberate us from all of the unhappiness and all of the pains and sufferings that are so present in this world. It is a law of liberty. It liberates us from the worst kind of slavery that anyone can suffer. He beholdeth himself, he goeth his way, and he, didn't, he forgets all about it. It didn't do any good then to find it. If you just see the law and you read it and don't do anything about it, you go your way and forget about it, you'll never get into God's kingdom. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, we have to be a doer of it, he being not a forgetful hearer, 
but a doer of the law, of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Now, you still need the blood of Christ to cleanse you for all the sins that are past. You still need the Holy Spirit to help you to walk with God and overcome and open your mind to understand the Bible to know what is the way you have to walk and what you, the way you have to live. If any man among you seem to be religious and brighteneth not his tongue but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. So there are a lot of religious people who still don't have truth. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless, the widows in their afflictions, to keep himself unspotted from the world. Unspotted from the world. How much of the world do we let into our lives, brethren? I, I just wanted to bring that before you tonight. I think we need to think about that. Well, I see that we've got 15 more minutes. Well, I'm going to start on in the next verse, but uh, in the next chapter, but uh, we may not get through it. But let's continue, because... James is one of the real important books of the Bible, and I think it gets neglected a great deal of the time. My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect to persons. You notice it's not your faith in Christ, it's the faith of Christ in you. I want you to notice that. And that's in Galatians, the third chapter, and other places too in the Bible, that we need the faith of Christ. You don't need to work up your own faith. Just believe what God says, obey God, and ask him to give you the same faith that Christ used to walk on water. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to walk on water. I, I, I think it'd be a little bit of nonsense if we tried to. There's no reason why we should. There is a reason why Jesus did. But we should not have respect to persons. Now he goes on to explain that a little bit. If there come unto you in your assembly a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel, and uh, there come also a poor man in vile raiment, and you have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Or oh, you stand over there. Or you sit uh, there under my footstool, and you distinguish between them, you show respect to the one and not to the other. Are ye then partial in yourselves, and become judges of evil thoughts? Now, you have to explain a little bit of some things. That is assuming that the poor man came in and that's, uh, that's all he had and the best he had, but his mind was all right and his heart was all right. The other man was overly dressed, had some gold ring and extra fine clothing and things like that. Just because of position, we're not to show respect of persons. On the other hand, there are things in the Bible, and I've uh, written about that and preached sermons on it, that coming in God's presence when we come to church, we should wear whatever we have that is best. Now, if you happen to have some evening full dress, you don't need to wear that when you come to church. But uh, you, you should be reasonably dressed up. Because we're coming into the presence of Christ and of God. In 1 John, the first chapter, you will read that our fellowship is not only just with one another, it's with God the Father and also with Christ. They are here with us in spirit. They're here. We're coming into the presence of God. It makes me think of the time over in Jerusalem. And this was... Uh, as a matter of fact, this was on December the 1st, 1948. I remember the date because I had promised them in Jerusalem that we would be back on December the 1st to give them an answer about the uh, archaeological project and going into it, and that's when we started it. 
December the 1st, 1968. And uh, we were to have a meeting with the president of Israel, President uh, Shazar. Uh, he's since died, and there have been two other presidents since, and I, of course, know them both. But uh, I don't believe I had met President Shazar before this time. But uh, we were to have a meeting with him and give our answer. Well, I was with uh, Dr. Uh, well, I can't, I can't remember names. There are men that I've known that have been here on this campus. Uh, anyway, he's, he's one of the uh, uh, leading professors in the Hebrew University. Now, you know, over in Israel, they dress very casually. Israel uh, is a country of... Uh, uh, more or less poor people in a way. There are not very many wealthy people in Israel. And they're having a hard time. And their taxes are terrific over there for the government. They have to make every sacrifice in the world for their country. And uh, so they don't dress up much over there. Well, anyway, this professor or Dr. Uh, Aviram, Dr. Aviram, we met him in his office, and we started walking down the hall. We got halfway down the hall of his building, the building he was in, and uh, he saw me and said, wait a minute, I've got to go back and get a jacket on. He says, I'm going into the presence of the president. I, I must have a jacket on. He was just going with his bare shirt. So he went back and put a jacket on. Well, normally he wouldn't have done that, but... Going into the presence of the president, he had to dress up a little better. Well, we come into the presence of Jesus Christ and the presence of God Almighty the Father when we come to church. And I have had to write things about it. Now, Jesus himself in a parable gave us the title of a man that came without a wedding garment. He could have had it. He just was slouchy and didn't care how he came. And he was cast out. So it doesn't mean that you come dressed any old way. On the other hand, it doesn't mean that you must come dressed up with something better than you can afford to have. It does mean you dress up respectably with the best you have, or what you have. Now, of course, coming to church, we don't come in for evening tales and all that sort of thing. I had some tales made because I thought I was going to have to wear them when I had an audience with the uh, Emperor of Japan. But I, I did have to have tales of a kind in a morning coat. It couldn't be admitted without it. I had to have it. But real tales and uh, white tie I have never worn in my life. So you don't have to come in something like that. I never have. But we should dress modestly and properly when we come into the presence of God. So this is not saying anything contrary to that. It is showing that we assume here that the man who comes in with poor clothing just doesn't have anything better. So then we should be just as kind to him as we are to the rich man that came in with something else. Rich people, well, to me, they're a dime a dozen, if you know what I mean. I've known a great many of them. I did business only with the heads of big industries when I was 22 years old, until I was 30. I've known so many multimillionaires and so many men of that kind that they became common. Now, the first time I ever met a millionaire and walked into his office to have a talk with him, I, I was just frightened. I was only 19 years old. And I had never been in the presence of a millionaire before, and that, that really was frightening. But I finally got used to it. You know, I found out they're just human beings like I am, and like you are. Some of them have been a little more successful than others, and some of them made uh, the least in business, as the world counts it, and they have a little more money. But that's all. Anyway... We should not be a respecter of persons because of class or snotty stuff of that kind. Now, in England, they, they don't have it so much anymore, but they did have class distinction over there. For example, when I first went to England in 1947, even then, 
No man could go to the university unless his father had before him. They kept, they were snobbish, and they kept class distinctions. I think that's pretty well gone in England now. I hope so. Are you not then partial in yourselves, and are become judges of evil thoughts? Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom, which he hath uh, promised to them that love him? Now that does not mean that God wants you to be poor. Jesus ate with and had meetings with the rich. He did. But he also did with the poor. He just didn't make a distinction. He was there to serve and to help and to be a minister regardless. And that's the way we should be. And most of the men of God in the Bible were very wealthy men. Job, Abraham, Joseph. Many of them were very wealthy men, honored by God. God prospered those men, blessed them in whatever they did because they were serving God. Well, I think that's a pretty good place to stop. I'll leave that there and someone can just throw that paper out. I don't think we need it anymore now. It served its purpose tonight. I don't know whether it did Sunday or not. Anyway, nice to be with you again. I still would appreciate your continued prayers. I do need them, and you have mine. So I'll make that a deal between us that we pray for one another and that we continue to love one another and continue to love the God who first loved us and loved us as Jesus did enough to die for us and God the Father enough to give his only begotten Son to die for us. It's a wonderful thing to have the knowledge of the truth and how God has blessed us in this church. And here we are in the finest auditorium in the world. Just think how God has blessed us and given these things to us. We don't deserve it. I don't deserve any of it. I don't think any of us do. But God has blessed us. Let's thank him and praise him for his blessings and the way he has blessed us and what he has done. Let's continue to serve him. Let's continue to get that leaven out of our lives all we can and come out of this world. So good night until I see you next time. <laughs>